All right, you guys introduce yourselves. Take it away. I'm Cynthia. I'm Will. Marlene. Uh, so we're going to talk about hospice care. Uh, show of hands, how many people know what hospice is? <laughs> I know you guys probably know what the cahoots, but I got one, a few more for you. <laughs> treating the, um, their disease process, you're mostly just treating their symptoms. Um, so what we do is you wanna make a patient as comfortable as possible, ease their pain, um, and uh, one of the toughest things is like their family members. Uh, so you know, the focus is to treat the patient, uh, not the disease. Um, and then you want to try to preserve quality of life for as long as you can. So in hospice, you have home care and like hospice centers. 
So a lot of patients, they want to be in their own homes, you know, for the last six months or however long in the comfort. So what you do is you have uh, nurses and the healthcare team to go visit them and just try to keep them going as long as you can, but it, uh, mostly keep them comfortable. What's not covered? So um, the benefit will not pay for treatment intended to cure your terminal illness or unrelated to that illness, prescription drugs to cure your illness, room and board in a nursing home or hospice residential facility or care in the emergency room, inpatient facility, care or ambulance transportation, unless it's either arranged by the hospice team or is unrelated to the terminal disease. So pretty much just anything to cure whatever um, disease you have will not be covered. So um, how are you eligible to receive hospice services? A hospice physician and a secondary physician, usually like their attending physician, must certify that the patient meets specific medical eligibility criteria. So the patient's life expectancy is less than six months. If the illness, disease, or condition runs its typical course, However, if the individual lives longer than six months and their condition continues to decline, they may be recertified by a physician or a nurse practitioner for additional time in hospice care. Similarly, if a hospice patient condition improves, they may be discharged from hospice care. The patient is eligible for hospice again if his or, condition, his or her condition begins to decline. So you can go in and out of hospice care. If you do get better, you can go out, and then if you continue to decline, you can go back in. So there's different levels of care you can receive on hospice care, and two of them are you can receive in the home. So the first one is routine home care. So this is the most common type of hospice. So like a nurse or a health aide will come in and visit you usually <coughs> at, usually once a day, and they'll check like the vitals or check in with like the patient or the caregiver and see how like the night before went, see if any medications need to be adjusted. adjusted. And then there's continuous home care, so that's around the clock continuous care at home. So this is usually when like the patient is in a time of crisis, so like if their caregiver is not able to care for them at the home or like a symptom flares up. And then there's general inpatient care, so this is short-term inpatient hospice care during times when pain and symptoms are not being managed without having to be in a hospital setting. So this is kind of like and in between between the home and the hospice so like there's nurses there at the facility and they'll help get the pain under control and then there's respite care so this is short term patient care when the patient's caregiver needs a break from caregiving and it's usually to prevent caregiver burnout um, roles of the hospice nurse assess level of anxiety of the patient provide pain management um, educate the patient and the family, provide patient comfort, and focus on the patient's needs. Um, this hospice nurse can declare a time of death, whereas a registered nurse and like any other in hospital can't. You want to be there for the family, allow time for the family to be with the deceased patient if they choose. Um, say, I'm sorry, so-and-so has died. Would you like to use this time to say your final goodbyes rather than saying like passed away or no longer with us, etc. And you want to provide supportive measures. Last one. Yeah, so I have a pretty cool from my pop at a hospice place, 
and these they eat anything. So like they'll load up on the salt, the bacon. It's just whatever they want for like because you never know when's their last meal gonna be. So kind of just help them out, you know, give them the sugar. So what you'll learn is a lot of drugs they have like off-label benefits. So morphine is used for pain, but it's also a bronchodilator. So what it does is it relaxes their bronchioles and allows them to breathe better. So a lot of patients in hospice when they're in pain or like they go through like certain they call like the death breathing, the death strokes. What you do is you give them more the, yeah, shine strokes, that's what called. Not death strokes. It's a really death rattle. That's it, yeah. What it'll do is just relax them and reduce their anxiety and just help them breathe, uh, breathe better and reduces their pain. of it your insurance will also pay but some people who don't have those have to pay out of pocket semester or spring semester and I got I was like last pick so I kind of got stuck with hospice but it turned out it's actually like really good because throughout your career you're gonna have patients that die it's just that's what happens but in hospice it's like completely different than anything like you'll do. like it is sad but like you kind of get I don't want to say used to it but you get uh, comfortable with dying and how you know how you can freshly be there for your patients I mean like you're doing things like like giving your patients back rubs and stuff like it, it may seem weird but it, they're kind of on their deathbed, you know, so you do everything that any little thing like you would want for your family to be done. So it's good. Yeah, yeah I just felt like the same thing. And then even just seeing at the hospital center, like the different stages, like the family, the patients still kind of in denial about like that they're dying. And then also like families like accepting it. Like my one patient, she had like end stage COPD and like times like she can't she's like I can't breathe I can't breathe and like the nurse is like well that's kind of like where you're at like it's not going to get better like you have oxygen like so I'm, like for her it was just having someone sit with her and just talk with her which kind of calmed her down 
Did she get medication for the anxiety part? Yeah, I think she had a PRN, like yeah. an Ativan, yeah. Because people that can't breathe try holding a breath during yeah. like the time. You're panicked, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, just the thoughts of like being in a closed place for most of us when you know the air is going to run out is quite threatening. So I would just say that um, what were your expectations when you went in to work with uh, people? Now you, I'm thinking yours is in the hospital because you work as an aide. An extern. An extern. Okay. So did that help you kind of get comfortable? Mm -hmm. Okay. And at one point, like it, through population health, um, how did you feel that you grew from that experience? It just like become more comfortable. So like when I first went in, you just it, it almost felt awkward because you didn't know what to say or what to do. And sometimes you don't have to do anything. You just kind of let them talk to you. I mean, some guy, he stopped dialysis like a day ago, and even within like the eight hours we were there for clinical, you could see how fast he was declining. But he was just talking about like how he's a firefighter and stuff like that. So you just kind of get their mind off everything and help them relax. But it builds with time. Like when you guys go into your first med search clinical, you're going to, or if you're in it, but you're not going to have any idea what you're doing. You're going to try to take vitals and mess that up. But it's over time, you become more comfortable and just even like your communication with your patients will build up. It's interesting because um, this is my same class, but in the accelerated group, um, one of the students who we were talking about, we were talking about dying patients at one point, and his first experience in hospice, his patient died. Yes, what, yes. So, yes. like, he had never been exposed to death that close, you know, and so there are things that you know, you have to do when a patient dies as a nurse in the hospital, you know, you're um, cleaning them up, you're getting the dentures in the mouth so that their jaw doesn't go into rigor mortis and then they have to break their jaw to get the, the undertaker would have to break the jaw to get the teeth in for a viewing purposes. Um, you're discontinuing tubes and lines and things like that. You don't have much of that in hospice, right? Oh, well, we have like chest tubes. And chest like tubes, that. okay. So you would have to discontinue the chest tubes or Foley catheters, things like that. Um, in the hospital, you're preparing for pickup by the, you know, the funeral parlor. Usually there's somebody, you know, listed on their record, but of course you want to accommodate family coming in and you know, saying their goodbyes and everything. And you try to be considerate of that. So for a lot of new nurses, having a patient die on them the first time is <coughs> kind of traumatic. It's very emotional, you know. And so, but you have to anticipate that that can happen at any time. And I think what's even harder probably is when it's a kid or unintended accident, like a motor vehicle accident where you lose someone. So we need to, have, um, you know, think about this process of death, you know, and, um, and as nurses, we, we don't get hard to it, but we have to actually go through some, you know, adjustments ourselves emotionally to be able to handle that in a professional way. You know, communicate to the family in a professional way. Is anyone here afraid of touching a dead body? It's weird. <laughs> it's weird. It's weird. It's weird. Well, at first, yeah. Okay. Well, why is it weird? Well, I mean, like, it's especially when you build like a relationship with that person that it, it's sad. So, but you gotta remember, it's not about you. So you just gotta do what you can, and then like when the families come in, you just wanna make sure you know they're in the best condition, well, like, looking-wise, that is mm -hmm. make it. Can you add anything to what I shared about, like, you know, getting the patient ready for the family to come in and look at them? Or? Yeah, so that's, like, the tough thing, because a lot of times they call it, like, um, the bath, of, like, whatever, when you give them a bath, sometimes it puts them over the edge, like that, like, the, the rolling and stuff can actually, like, end up, like, being that, the last bath, the last bath, but... So mostly what we do when we go in, it's just, you go in, we do a lot of aromatherapy and like, like certain motions and stuff, but then it's just,
making sure like they look good. When you, like you walk by the hallway, and every patient looks comfortable, like it's clean, you know what I mean? Like we shave their face and do everything just to make sure like, you know, when the families come in, they are ready for that. But it's different. It's certainly it's nice. easier to shave before their rigor kicks in yeah. and they're cold because, you know, it takes a while for the, uh, and they usually go by liver temperature. You know, it takes a few hours for the body to become really cold. You know, so the warmer it is, the easier it is if you have to, you know, shave them. It's almost like an immediate thing. And also the denture thing is a big issue, you know, because you don't like to think that the, you know, the undertaker has to, you know, traumatize this corpse, you know, because we didn't get the teeth in and then secure the jaw up with some ties. So we don't want the ties to be on when the family comes, but you can use a towel or something to kind of, you know, prop them up or whatever. There's some cultures that really get skittish over a dead person. Um, and some of those cultures um, are people of color. Um, I had students down at Sacred Heart before we went to a psych unit and it was like, you know, the, they were wheeling a, a body down to the morgue after all that was done. And like, there were people like getting the willies just in the hallway. You know, you try not to make it obvious when you're, you know, taking a patient out of their room and down to the morgue. But it's, you know, some people are quite aware of what you're doing and it makes them a little squeamish. So we have to be considerate of those things. One last question. What would you say like um, about the burden of a dying patient being in the home setting on the family? So in the clinical, if you guys do it, you you rotate every week. So one week you're in the hospice center at Taylor Hospital spread on the corner, but then the other week you're on the road and you visit uh, like home hospice. And you can see like, ton of different like living uh, environments and stuff but I mean we've seen patients where the husband would be on hospice and the 90 year old wife is taking care of them and then you know what I mean so you, you see like weird situations I mean some like um, you can see like uh, what happens is you have uh, it's called caretaker neglect so what happens is the patient like um, the family member gets kind of burnt out taking care of them and then you can see it's not intentional, but there is like some neglect going on. And then that's when respite care comes in. And what it did, it's like daycare almost for the family so they can drop them off for a few days, go on vacation, and then have the uh, hospice center take care of them. It kind of just give them a break just to avoid that. I think a lot of families, when they sign up for hospice, think that there's going to be somebody there doing everything around the clock. And that's not always true. And so the family has some, you know, burdens as well, you know, um, maybe medicating, toileting the patient, you know, it depends on how severe <coughs> the, the ending symptoms are. But I think it does take an emotional toll. The hospice nurses come in and they really try to relieve <coughs> for the patient. Um, but there are a lot of nurses that really do enjoy that work because they feel like they are making that end of life process better than what we can provide um, in the acute care setting like an ICU for both the patient and the family. And we're going to be looking at some of those videos on Wednesday when we get back together. So thank you very much. We really appreciate both groups coming in and um, sharing their experience with us as seniors.